In our lead story today, we travel to the Middle East, where uh, both the heart and the periphery of the Israel-Hamas war the last week has had no shortage of destruction, from devastating airstrikes and concerning allegations against Syria to the deaths of dozens of refugees in Gaza to ongoing affairs in the West Bank and more. Let's dig in. Our first news item took place in the evening hours local time on the night of Sunday, September the 8th in the Hamar province in central Syria. There, Israel launched a series of airstrikes with missiles crashing down across multiple locations in Hamar province. As warplanes streaked overhead, the airstrikes continued for multiple hours between different targets, with some landing in allegedly civilian-occupied areas and some taking place per the testimony of first responders, while responders were already on scene and working to extinguish the fires from attacks immediately prior. The UK-based monitoring group, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, indicated that at least 26 people were dead in the aftermath, including five civilians, 14 Syrians working with pro-Iran groups, four members of the Syrian regime's military, and three unidentified. Syria's health ministry confirmed at least 18 dead, and Syria's state news organization Sonar indicated that a minimum of 37 more were injured. The specific targets of Israel's strikes are disputed, and the entire target list is not yet clear, although some specific impacted sites are known. Among the apparent military targets was a scientific research center in the city of Masyaf, where, per the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, quote, Iranian militias and experts are stationed to develop weapons in Syria. Those weapons, according to the same organization, include short and medium-range precision-guided missiles and drones. And at the facility, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps officers have had a sustained presence for the last six years. The Reuters news agency reported that per intelligence sources, a branch of the scientific research center that's known to be used for chemical arms production was also hit in the strikes, although other anonymous sources in the know have disputed that claim, and Syria has denied it. Syria is believed to have an ongoing chemical weapons research and development program. A highway in Hamar was also struck and damaged, sparking a fire, according to Syrian state news, while Syria's minister for electricity alleged major damage to water and electrical infrastructure, along with the killing of, quote, mostly civilians. Syrian local authorities alleged that a fiber optic cable beneath the struck highway in Hamar had been damaged. Elsewhere, in the coastal city of Tatus, air defense missile interceptors from the Syrian side were reported falling to the ground after apparently missing their targets. Syrian military sources speaking to the BBC did confirm that some missile interceptions were successful. Israel didn't acknowledge Sunday night's attacks into Syria, but it's widely understood that Jerusalem was responsible. Now, it's not the first time that Israel has struck into Syria. In fact, it's done so on 64 separate occasions since the start of 2024 in an effort to diminish or eliminate Iran-allied militia groups, including, but not limited to, Hezbollah. Those militias have launched numerous attacks across the Syria-Israel border and from southern Lebanon. In its prior strikes, Israel has targeted weapons depots, specific vehicles, headquarters buildings for Iran-allied local militias, and, quite infamously back in April, a consulate building where multiple high-ranking members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps were killed. All in all, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights estimates that 208 Syrian, Hezbollah, Iranian, and other combatants have been killed in Israel's strikes this year, plus 22 civilians. Those prior strikes also set off a massive explosion in tensions between Iran and Israel directly, including the April attack by Iran that sent no fewer than 300 missiles and drones in a seemingly symbolic direct assault against Israel. But even compared to the prior strikes of 2024, this particular action from Israel in the past week is unique for a number of reasons. It was a significantly more expansive attack than usual, longer in duration, diversified against more targets, and with a higher death toll. Whether the size and scope of the strikes signified what Israel perceived to be a heightened Syrian threat, or whether they constitute an anomaly in what's basically business as usual, is not known. And from news of one major Israeli airstrike, we move urgently to news of another, this one coming out of a narrow, eight-mile-long strip of land outside Khan Yunus, referred to as al Mawasi on the Mediterranean beaches of Gaza. Long-time viewers of the Situation Room, especially those with a particularly keen memory, will remember our discussions of al Mawasi from some time ago, after it was designated a safe zone inside Gaza for displaced people. It still holds that distinction today, with the support of both the Israel Defense Forces and the United Nations and it's meant to offer shelter to about half a million Gazans who've been displaced often several times since the Israel-Hamas war began. But overnight on Tuesday, September the 10th, as refugees of al Mawasi slept in their tightly packed tent camps, an Israeli precision strike hit the camp directly with at least three heavy munitions. According to the Israel Defense Forces, the reason for the strike was fundamentally the same as any number of other strikes that have killed civilians in Gaza. 
Per the IDF, numerous senior Hamas terrorists had established a position inside Al-Mawasi and were operating, quote, within a command and control center embedded in the humanitarian area. Israel claimed that three Hamas commanders who had been killed in the strike had been directly involved in the massive Hamas terror attack of October the 7th, 2023. But accounts from Al-Mawasi differ from the IDF's claims dramatically, and we'll warn you in advance the following quotes pretty difficult to hear. Said one refugee at the camp speaking to reporters, quote, people flew. It's indescribable. We had to dig our children out from under the sand. Said another, quote, we heard around five or six strikes, one after the other. We rushed to help and saw women and children cut to pieces, but there are still people missing. A spokesman for Gaza's Emergency and Rescue Civil Defense Force, an organization that we do emphasize is under the de facto control of Hamas in Gaza, reported that the bombs fell without warning, destroying somewhere between 20 and 40 tents and leaving behind three deep blast craters. Continued that spokesman, Mohammed Basal, quote, There are entire families who have disappeared under the sand in the Mawasi Khan Yunus massacre. In the immediate aftermath of the strike, an official with the Civil Defense Network stated that 40 bodies had been transported to nearby hospitals, including 60 wounded. The number of dead was later adjusted to 19. Rescue efforts were ongoing at that time to attempt to locate an additional 15 missing who are believed to have been buried in the sand. For their part, civilians on the ground have denied any knowledge of a Hamas presence at the location that was struck, although oh, we should emphasize that across the Israel-Hamas war, it has been commonplace for Hamas to base its operations at or very near protected civilian areas. The strike was among the deadliest to rock al Malasi since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, and if the death toll continues to rise as expected, it'll be the second deadliest since al Malasi was designated as a humanitarian safe zone by the Israel Defense Forces. But it's not the only major airstrike there to cause mass casualties in the span of the last few months. On May the 28th of this year, over 20 people were killed in a similar bombing, and on June the 21st, another 25 or more were killed, although both figures are disputed. On July the 13th, over 90 Palestinians were reported dead in al Mawasi, along with over 300 more injured in a strike that purportedly targeted a Hamas military leader, Mohammed Daif. That strike included the use of no fewer than eight 2,000-pound bombs. Yet in all of this, as with the strike on September the 10th, we must emphasize yet again that al Mawasi is a place where displaced Gazans have been specifically instructed to take shelter for the long term. On the question of whether Hamas fighters are inside the camp, well, to put it simply, it would be stunning if a camp of half a million Gazans didn't have Hamas members inside. But whether the benefit to Israel of eliminating the Hamas commanders it's alleged to be present there is worth the humanitarian devastation it's wrought inside its own designated safe zone several times now is a far more difficult question that the Israeli public, if not Israel's leaders, will continue to grapple with. Far at the opposite end of Israel's claimed territory, another attack bears discussion, this one coming at the Allenby Bridge border crossing between Israel's neighbor nation of Jordan and the Israel-occupied West Bank Territory. There, on Sunday the 8th, a Jordanian gunman killed three Israeli civilians at the border checkpoint in a commercial cargo area where Jordanian trucks offload their cargo before that cargo transited into the West Bank. The shooter, a 39-year-old member of Georgian's Huaytat tribe and a resident of a southern region of the country, was killed at the scene by Israeli security forces. He was a retired soldier, but was at the border in his capacity as a driver, where he is believed to have made drop-offs of goods to the checkpoint before. Per Israel, the attack began and ended quickly. The gunman arrived at the border checkpoint in a truck, got out of his truck, opened fire at security forces, and killed three civilians at close range in the process. Although the shooting is now under investigation in Jordan, the gunman's precise motivations are not yet known. The civilian victims were three men in their 50s and 60s, all Israelis. In the immediate aftermath of the incident, all of Israel's five border crossings with Jordan were closed, and at least two dozen Jordanian truck drivers were detained by Israeli soldiers for interrogation. Hamas did not claim responsibility for the attack. And it's an important attack to take note of, because despite Israel's strikes into Syria or against the al Mawasi humanitarian zone, this particular attack is the first of its kind. Since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, Jordanian border crossings with the West Bank have been immune from any form of attack. That has been especially important to maintain some semblance of order in the West Bank, a region that's been rocked by violence over the past 11 months, but where 3 million Palestinian residents rely on an influx of Jordanian goods to help address basic needs. Not only that, but Jordan and Israel have kept a mostly cordial relationship since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, with Jordan even directly intervening on Israel's behalf when Iran launched its April drone and missile attack. The two countries share close security ties, and Jordanian goods flow not just to the West Bank, but also to Israel proper. Yet the shooting at the border crossing exposed a rising disconnect between the Jordanian government's conduct toward Israel and the will of its people. 
In the aftermath, crowds of hundreds of people took to the streets in the Jordanian capital city of Amman, celebrating and praising the gunmen for having avenged the deaths of Palestinians in Gaza. Those marches died down relatively quickly and they haven't been repeated, so on that front at least, we're not bringing this piece of news because it's opening some new and unforeseen dimension of hostilities. But it does serve as a critical window into the broader situation inside Jordan, where anti-Israel sentiment is on the rise and violent attacks are becoming more likely, whether the country's leaders like it or not. Also in the West Bank, locals have begun reconstruction in several areas, primarily in the city of Jenin in its nearby refugee camp after Israel concluded a nine-day major operation there. Jenin, a city with a civilian population of about 60,000, is known to be a hotbed of anti-Israel militant activity, and over the last couple of weeks, it's been the epicenter of a major Israeli occupation and anti-terror operation. At the time, the operation prompted fears of major crackdowns in Jenin and across the West Bank, and now that IDF soldiers have withdrawn, locals and international observers have been able to observe the after-effects directly. Per the Palestinian Authority, the government that administers the West Bank, a minimum of 36 Palestinians were killed in the operation, including 21 from Jenin and the surrounding area. While most of the dead have been identified as members of Palestinian armed groups, the Palestinian Authority has reported that children were also killed. Per the BBC, the number of children confirmed dead stands at eight. One Israeli soldier is reported dead in the aftermath. Residents are now returning to the streets of Jenin after 20,000 were forced to take shelter for much of the Israeli operation with no water, no electricity and minimal food. Now, in the aftermath, many have found their homes in ruin or pockmarked by bullet holes in the wake of intense street skirmishes. The city central road has been made impassable by the effects of the occupation, and local hospitals are recovering after several days spent relying on generators and stored water. Local electrical and water infrastructure is reportedly severely damaged and will take substantial time to repair. Elsewhere in the West Bank, the last several days saw an international incident break out between Israel and the United States after the death of a 26-year-old American woman who had been protesting against Israel's occupation in a town near the city of Nablus. While the IDF alleges that the protest where she was killed was a, quote, violent riot, a number of conflicting reports have indicated that the protest was far more subdued. Israel has since admitted that it is, quote, highly likely that IDF troops killed the American woman in a shooting that the U.S. has denounced as, quote, unprovoked and unjustified and has insisted indicates a need for, quote, fundamental change the way Israel conducts itself in Gaza, the West Bank and elsewhere. It was a rare and uncommonly forceful rebuke of Israel by the nation that serves as its most prominent and most indispensable foreign backer. All the while, the rest of the world's ultimate objective in Israel, a ceasefire to end the fighting between the IDF and Hamas, remains elusive. While international sources, including sources from the three nations brokering the talks, the US, Egypt and Qatar, suggest that some of the more divisive negotiating items have been brought toward a compromise, other fundamental differences remain. The major sticking point at this stage is reported to be control over the corridor between Gaza and its only non-Israel land neighbor, Egypt. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has continually insisted that Philadelphia will remain occupied until it's declared fully secure by the IDF, a position that Hamas will not accept under any circumstances. The most recent reporting at the time of writing indicates that both sides are entrenching themselves into their current negotiating positions rather than working toward a compromise. Of course, the difficult reality remains that without a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, violence of every sort is likely to continue. Not just devastation in Gaza, but in the West Bank, in Syria, across the Middle East, and in new and unexpected areas of the region that have yet to break down. For both sides to reach a ceasefire arrangement is of paramount importance now, but that elusive agreement seems as far away as ever. Next up, we turn to the skies over Russia, where on September the 10th, Ukraine rocked its larger neighbor with a coordinated drone assault of near unprecedented size. The attack came in the late hours of the evening, when over 144 unmanned drones crossed the border into Russia and attacked targets all up and down Russia's west. We say over 144 here because, according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, its air defense systems logged 144 Ukrainian drones intercepted and shot down, but the number was almost certainly higher. We know that because Russia didn't just perform a purported 144 successful interceptions. It also suffered some rather substantial hits in the process. The drones attacked in several directions simultaneously, eventually being recorded in over no fewer than nine regions of Russia, including the most important of all, 
Moscow. Per the Russian MOD, no fewer than 20 drones swarmed over the capital city, metro population 21 million, and of the drones targeting Moscow, several made impacts with targets before they could be intercepted. The most significant impacts came at a cluster of high-rise apartment buildings in Moscow's Ramenskoye district, where multiple flats were set on fire, buildings were evacuated, three people were wounded, and one, a 46-year-old woman, was killed. Drones and their debris fell across several residential areas, sparking fires across neighborhoods, while some 70 drones shot down over Bryansk region recorded no damage per the Russian MOD. Three major airports were shut down for about six hours each, including Russia's second and third busiest airports nationwide, and some 50 flights had to be diverted to other airports. The impacted airports included Domodedovo, which hadn't previously come under attack over the course of the current conflict, as well as Zhukovsky, a smaller airport that took the better part of a day to reopen after the cleanup of drone debris. Overall, the attack appears to have been relatively low damage, and Ukraine has not yet acknowledged any of its intended targets, but the scale and scope of the attack mean that it definitely warrants discussion today. Now, look, before we go any further, we should emphasize that it's not clear whether Ukraine intended to strike civilian buildings in its drone assault, or whether the drone impacts on residential neighborhoods were a result of Russian air defense interceptions. Russia, unsurprisingly, claims that it was an intentional act. As said a spokesman for the Kremlin, Dmitry Pashkov, after the attack, there is no way that nighttime strikes on residential neighborhoods can be associated with military action. The Kiev regime continues to demonstrate its nature. They are our enemies, and we must continue the special military operation to protect ourselves from such actions. The quote ends. Indeed, we should emphasize that international attacks on civilians, or attacks that don't distinguish between military targets and civilians, are prohibited war crimes under international humanitarian law. Of course, while there is never justification for a war crime under any circumstances, we should also emphasize that hundreds of verifiably deliberate Russian attacks have killed over 10,000 Ukrainian civilians since the start of the current conflict. So, you know, there's that. Moving from the impact of this particular strike in a vacuum, it's perhaps even more important to address its context. This is the second major drone attack of this type in as many weeks, after a 1st of September attack saw the Russian MOD claim interceptions of no fewer than 158 drones in 15 Russian regions. That wave hit a refinery and a power station deep in Russia. Although the exact number of launched drones in both that attack and this one isn't firmly established, since the number of drones launched and the number of drones intercepted isn't necessarily the same, the two attacks are the first and second largest Ukrainian attacks against Russia since the start of the war two and a half years ago. From that alone, we can glean a few key takeaways. Namely, that Ukraine is not short on the long-range drones that can reach far into Russia. That Ukraine is growing its capacity to conduct these strikes into Russia as the war goes on, rather than diminishing, and that the deterrent promises of retaliation by Russia for all these sorts of attacks, once so feared by Ukraine's Western backers, now appear to have lost their teeth. Ukraine's homegrown drone manufacturing industry has taken off since the start of the war, and as these swarm attacks have grown larger and more common, it's a positive indicator for Ukraine that its domestic production capacity is growing more and more robust by the day. And it's also worth noting that even on the day of this most recent sweeping drone attack, it was by no means the only drone swarm barrage of the night. As Ukrainian drones were flying into Russia, Russian ones were flying into Ukraine, including 46 Iranian-designed Shahed drones along with two missiles. 36 of the drones and both missiles were taken down by Ukrainian air defense, and no major damage was reported. A few days ago, on September the 7th, Russia launched 67 Shaheds. Ukraine shot down 58, with no damage recorded, although debris of one drone was located outside Ukraine's parliament building. The contrast between the Russian and Ukrainian attacks, though, go beyond the simple fact that Ukraine's salvos hit more than Russia's did. They also involved the use of several times more drones per assault, not just with the potential to do more damage, but to stress Russian air defense systems more than Russia's attacks against Ukraine. Make no mistake, while Ukraine strikes have been spread over many Russian regions with the apparent intent of sending a message to the Russian people, they don't have to be spread out like that. A similar attack, with drone swarms of 100 or 200 clustered into a smaller geographic region, would likely be able to overwhelm localized air defense systems, and Russia's military planners almost certainly know that. But the most important context of all, of course, is to place Ukraine's drone strikes in context to the rest of the war. 
On the most brutal portions of the front lines, Russia is advancing at a faster pace than it's done in a very long time, now closing in with increasing efficiency around the strategic city of Pokrovsk in the Donbass region. Now sitting on a front line just seven or eight kilometers from the city, Russia is progressively leveling the city, knowing that if it can capture the spot, it will break down Ukrainian supply lines and probably force a retreat from spots like Chasiv Yar or even Kramatorsk, basically ceding the entire Donetsk blast or region to Russia. Meanwhile, Russia has, at the time of writing, launched a major counteroffensive against an occupying Ukrainian force in Russia's Kursk region, with that counteroffensive being just hours old at the time of writing. Although it was initially hoped that Ukraine's Kursk offensive could siphon some Russian troops away from the Donbass, that doesn't appear to have happened. And although we can practically guarantee that we'll know more about Russia's counteroffensive when you see this episode than when we wrote it, early reports indicate that several settlements have been taken back. Also in Russia's favor, the nation has reportedly taken possession of hundreds of Iranian short-range ballistic missiles, uh, which it can use on its front lines, and thus make medium and long-range missiles available for penetrating strikes deeper into Ukraine. Yet with the Kursk offensive stalling and failing to budge Russian lines in the Donbass, and with Pokrovsk not far from capture, the timing of these unprecedentedly massive drone assaults gains all the more significance, because it shows yet another indicator of what Ukraine's broader strategy has been for some time. When Ukraine was working to slow Russia's advance along a broad front line, it responded to Russian attacks in a certain area by launching an attack in another, providing a counterway to take some steam off of the Russian assault. When Russia began its advance on Pokrovsk, Ukraine looked for a counterweight in Kursk, and when that proved ineffective, Ukraine began searching for another counterweight, this time in the skies over Moscow. And even as Ukraine's drones get larger and more frequent, it's on the verge of adding more counterweights after that. Per US President Joe Biden speaking to reporters on Tuesday the 10th of September, the White House is looking to lift restrictions on Ukraine's use of long-range weapons that America and other Western nations have supplied. That effort is backed by several senior members of the Republican Party in the US, Biden's political opponents, and oh, Russia responded to the news by threatening a direct response from Moscow. That's a threat that the US and its allies already understood, and that appears to command only diminishing value as a deterrent. If those restrictions are lifted, Ukraine will be able to strike with far greater precision using weapons that are harder for Russia to stop. It should be no surprise that that news comes just as Russia has purportedly taken Iranian missiles into its possession, opening up greater Russian potential for long-range strikes. Along the most bitterly contested areas of the front line, Russia has the momentum. Pokrovsk is in reach. The thousand-plus square kilometers of Ukrainian-controlled Kursk are under threat, and Russia's war machine is, as ever, at a major advantage on paper over Ukrainian forces. But more and more over the last few months, Ukraine has been bringing the war home to Russia, and as this latest drone swarm reaffirms, that effort has only just begun. Next up, we travel to the United States, to both the city and the state of New York, where America's greatest global rival has been implicated in a case of classic great power espionage. In the past week, federal prosecutors unveiled a sweeping indictment against one Linda Sun, a former high-ranking aide to both New York's most recent former governor, Andrew Cuomo, and its current governor, Kathy Hochul. According to the indictment, Linda Sun wasn't just a power player in New York politics, she had spent years as a Chinese secret agent manipulating the state's governors and its other high officials in exchange for lavish rewards from Beijing. The allegations of Linda Sun's misconduct are wide-ranging, including everything from direct actions to bar China's enemies from access to the New York state government to a long effort to propagate China's preferred messaging wherever it was possible. Sun purportedly prevented Taiwanese officials from being able to interact with the office of the state governor. She ensured that Taiwanese visiting officials were unable to meet directly with state leaders, including current governor Kathy Hochul. She saw to it that New York officials did not speak publicly on China's persecution of Uyghur Muslims in its Xinjiang region, despite China implementing a long series of policies that experts around the world claim as being tantamount to genocide. Under her watch, references to Taiwan in official New York communications and statements were washed out, and the office of the governor pushed back against regular efforts in the New York state legislature to induce symbolic pro-Taiwan resolutions. She provided unauthorized invitations on behalf of the governor's office to Chinese officials in order to ease their passage to state meetings in New York and arrange for them to receive official proclamations from the governor, despite not having been cleared to do so. At the same time, her role in the governor's office saw her take on increasing ambassadorship roles to 
toward New York's Asian American community, and she was a key part of the team within the New York state government that solicited personal protective equipment and other supplies from China at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Although Sun apparently never had the opportunity to grant state contracts or procurement deals with Chinese corporations directly, the indictment against her indicates a broad pattern of coordinated anti-Taiwan pro-China influence across not just months, but years of government service. All the while, Sun was a direct beneficiary of the Chinese government, with both she and her husband, Chris Hu, who, by the way, has been charged with money laundering as a part of the scandal, living a lavish lifestyle that quite transparently exceeded their means. Although they lived in a middle-class co-op building in Queens, and although Sun frequently asked for raises from her superiors, she was nonetheless known for showing up to her office in designer outfits complete with handbags. She and her husband were given hard-to-get event tickets, travel benefits, and assistance with millions of dollars worth of transactions for a business with time to her husband. Sun and her husband laundered the millions of dollars worth of money they were paid out, likely through several shell companies her husband appears to have created between 2016 and 2023, as well as his liquor store. Prosecutors allege that the pair operated up to 80 different shell accounts of various kinds. With the money they were given, they purchased a five-bed, $3.6 million home on Long Island, a 2024 Ferrari, a $1.9 million condo in Hawaii, and other luxury vehicles. And among the other perks, the indictment against her alleges, Sun apparently received received regular deliveries of Nanjing-style salted ducks, half a dozen at a time, every few months, as prepared by a Chinese consular official's private chef. Now, on the one hand, the indictment against Sun and her husband is sweeping in nature, describing nothing short of a years-long infiltration of a major office of state government within the United States. The nature of the indictment is quite damning, and the conduct of Sun and her husband will likely continue to be the subject of outrage in New York and elsewhere, especially if the allegations against them are ultimately supported in court. But at the same time, we've got to emphasize that our reason for sharing this story on the Situation Room is not to say that it constitutes some major national security breach on the part of the United States. Sun did have access to the New York governor office, and she did use that office on behalf of the Chinese government, but the things she achieved certainly don't place the survival of the United States in jeopardy. Far from it. Instead, we're focused on the underlying story here, Linda Sun's actions, and the Chinese government's decision to recruit her as a telling example of just how and why China chooses to conduct espionage operations in the United States. Looking exclusively at the case of Linda Sun, a few key things stand out. For one thing, this is not an official with the capacity to influence U.S. strategy or foreign policy or any other broad element of American governance that China may hope to interfere with. For another, she's not a federal official at all. She's a state-level official with the power and influence to accomplish objectives of low to moderate importance for China at at least from an outside perspective, but with no ability to actually make the government of New York State do anything that the governor and other senior officials don't want it to. Sure, New York State is home to some 19 and a half million people. If it were a country, it would be more populous than the Czech Republic, Cuba, Portugal, Israel, or the UAE. Plus, of course, lots of other world nations. But it's not just a country. Its policy toward China is fundamentally the same as the rest of America's, and Sun didn't impact that in any broad or truly substantive way. New York has a thriving Chinese expat community, including many advocates against the CCP, but even Sun's ability to take action against perceived dissidents in that community was limited. Sure, New York ultimately declined to speak on the subject of Uyghur repression or express support for Taiwan in a few moments that it otherwise may have, but that was the extent of it. Yet it's precisely because of Linda Sun's limited influence, not in spite of it, that this case is quite so interesting to focus on. What Linda Sun and her husband did have influence over were issues largely related to speech about China and Taiwan, speech about China's domestic policies, and statements that could influence public perception, even among a relatively small proportion of people, about the Chinese state. And for Sun to be on retainer for Beijing, interfering when and where she could on those matters, was apparently worth many millions of dollars to China. Rather than simply exposing a small-time influence campaign, this is an incident that exposes and, in a way, reaffirms China's priorities priorities when it comes to espionage abroad. For Beijing, the ability to control and change the narrative around its own affairs in other countries is apparently so important that years of cooperation with Linda Sun were somehow worth it. For China, explained James Lewis of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a researcher studying Chinese foreign espionage, the development of Sun as an asset, despite her limited impact, would have been taken as a major success back in Beijing. 
Quoting Lewis in conversation with the New York Times here, it's a big coup to recruit the deputy chief of staff. If the CIA had recruited the Chinese equivalent, officials in Beijing would have flipped out and we would have seen it as a success. Perhaps validating at least the inverse of that assessment, the case of Linda Sun has generated widespread consternation across both New York and the US federal government, including from New York's current governor. Even just within New York, Linda Sun's case is far from the first instance of Beijing recruiting purported or confirmed agents to act on China's behalf. Just over a month ago, in early August of this year, a Queens resident named Xu Jun Wang was found guilty in federal court of having acted as a Chinese spy. Wang was a known and respected democracy activist and scholar in New York, at least in his public-facing persona, but he used his position to secretly gather information about Chinese nationals in the New York area who were active in what China considered to be subversive groups. The information Wang collected on people who advocated democracy in Hong Kong, independence for Taiwan and Tibet, and justice for Chinese Uyghurs uh, was passed on directly to the Chinese government. In 2023, three men were convicted in the same federal court of having stalked the family of a Chinese national, participating in a plot engineered by Chinese officials to drive their target back to China to face embezzlement charges with the potential for the death penalty. Those three were alleged to have been part of Operation Fox Hunt, a Chinese effort to repatriate fugitives who'd left their home nation. And earlier in 2023, two men were arrested on suspicion of having operated an unauthorized Chinese police outpost in Lower Manhattan with the intent of intimidating Chinese dissidents living in the U.S., while 34 other Chinese police officers were accused of harassment against Chinese nationals in and around New York. Like Linda San's alleged spy work, all these espionage operations were oriented toward the broad objective of suppressing criticism of the Chinese government, even on the local level. Several countries in Europe, as well as Canada, have reported dealing with similar operations on their own soil. As great power competition between the US and China continues to reach new levels of intensity, espionage cases like this one will become all the more important in both nations. In all likelihood, they'll also become more common as a higher number of ongoing operations by nature will lead to more opportunities for each government to identify infiltrations by the other. In the US, counterintelligence services have long been concerned about efforts to spy on members of the military, acquire state secrets from the US defense apparatus, and develop deep, surreptitious ties over the American tech industry. But just as important in this phase of espionage and counterespionage that is to come is the role of spies like Linda Sun. For China, as its own actions demonstrate, perceptions are everything, and dissent is intolerable. It'll be on the United States to keep that in mind, and to be just as diligent in civil government as in defense and technology. Linda Sun never rose further than deputy status in New York, but recruit enough spies and somebody on China's payroll eventually might. And from New York, we travel halfway around the world to the Red Sea, where despite a now months-long US-led coalition intervention, Yemen's Houthi rebel organization simply refuses to be stopped. The Iran-backed rebel group made news yet again on Sunday, the 8th of September, uh, with a claim that it had shot down an American-made MQ-9 Reaper drone as it flew high above areas of Yemen that the Houthis controlled. A $32 million drone capable of flying up to 50,000 feet and carrying up to eight Hellfire missiles or multiple laser-guided bombs, the MQ-9 is a staple of US-led counterinsurgency efforts. It's expensive, sophisticated, unmanned, and proven in combat environments all across the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. But the Reaper drone that Houthis purportedly shot down last Sunday wasn't the first they've hit. It was the eighth since they seized control of Yemen's capital city, Sana'a, in 2014, and just the latest in a long line to be shot down since the U.S. campaign to rein in the Houthis began, now the best part of a year ago. Speaking to the Associated Press, the United States said that it had no reports of a Reaper drone downed over Yemen, and at this time the Houthis hadn't supplied direct evidence of the shot down drone either. They usually don't provide such evidence right after they bring down a drone, but will instead, at times, use the footage and promotional videos long after the fact. A series of US-led airstrikes near the city of Ib, however, was noted by Yemeni satellites news shortly after the Houthi claim was made, and was confirmed by US Central Command shortly afterward in perhaps a tacit acknowledgement that something really did happen there. The CENCOM statement on the strikes indicated that they had destroyed three Houthi drones and two missile systems. 
Now, for anyone who's watched global news in the past year, the reason for the United States' coalition deployments against the Houthi rebels really shouldn't be any secret. Although they are territorially confined to Yemen, mostly, the Houthi rebels have proven to be a lingering troublemaker in the region owing to their country's position right next to one of the world's busiest maritime shipping lanes, the Red Sea, where ships feed in and out of the nearby Suez Canal at staggering rates. For several months, the Houthis have launched missile and drone attacks against defenseless trade ships, sinking two thus far, seizing one, killing four sailors, and driving up maritime insurance prices so effectively that much of the Red Sea's usual trade volume has been forced to circumnavigate the entire African continent rather than use the Suez Canal. The Houthis claim to target ships linked to Israel, as well as to the US and the United Kingdom, Israel's primary foreign backers, as a means of protest to force an end to Israel's campaign against Hamas in Gaza. Hamas, by the way, shares a common benefactor with the Houthis as both organizations draw their support from Iran. In reality, though, the Houthi campaign has been far more indiscriminate and has brought munitions raining down on ships with little to no association with any of the nations that the Houthis purportedly target. Since December of 2023, the United States has led Operation Prosperity Guardian, the coalition operation we've been referencing, in an effort to rein the Houthis in and protect the maritime shipping vessels that sail through the Red Sea. Many nations have joined in with the coalition, including everyone from Britain, Canada, and Australia to Singapore, New Zealand, Finland, Sri Lanka, and even the Seychelles. Yet, despite numerous interceptions of incoming Houthi aerial drones, missiles, and even highly dangerous sea drones, and despite operations to bomb Houthi weapon stores inside Yemen, the coalition has proven far less effective in stopping the Houthis than any participating nation would have expected. From the start of July to the start of September, Houthi attacks were able to strike nine ships, cause damage to six of them, and fires on two. And that's after the coalition has pulled out all the tricks and capabilities that one might have expected. Nor has a separate Saudi Arabia-led coalition been able to put much pressure on the rebels despite years of fighting, including in Marib province, where the latest Reaper drone was allegedly shot down. Meanwhile, the Houthis are in a position of seemingly copious amounts of weaponry supplied by Iran, including the most likely weapon to be used in a successful Reaper drone takedown, an Iranian-made surface-to-air missile known as the 358. And as we reaffirmed just this week, the Houthis have no problem with using those weapons despite the coalition, not just by attacking merchant ships, but by shooting down the very symbol of US and coalition air power over their territory. And while we're on the subject of the Houthis, we've got to pivot and discuss the other new development in the Red Sea conflict, a late addition that's perhaps best described as a ticking time bomb. That time bomb's name is Seunion, a, a Greek-flagged oil tanker that was targeted while it sailed off the coast of the Yemeni port city of Hodadar. It was hit first by gunfire from two small boats and then struck by three projectiles, starting a fire and leaving it without engine power. Although no oil spill has been conclusively reported as coming from the Seunion yet, it appears to be carrying about a million barrels of oil on board, equivalent to about 150,000 metric tons of the stuff. For that oil to spill, that could constitute the largest single ship oil spill in human history. And as of now, the Seunion is still floating, unable to be helped. Although it was hit weeks ago, at the time of writing, attempts to salvage the Seunion have proven unsuccessful. One salvage attempt by a non-coalition operator, as described by the US Department of Defense, proved unable to get to the ship after the Houthis threatened to attack. The Houthis also went out to the ship and took a purported video of themselves setting it on fire by detonating no fewer than six bombs simultaneously. Then, when the Houthis relented and agreed to a temporary truce so that tugboats could approach the ship, the private companies that attempted to intervene were forced to agree that the situation was simply too unsafe to manage. The ship is anchored and has long since been evacuated of its crew, but at this point it's near impossible to get out of the area and it's still on fire. An environmental disaster resulting from an oil spill from the Seunion could dwarf even the disaster created by the Exxon Valdez in 1989 when that ship ran aground in Alaska and contaminated 2100 kilometers or 1300 miles of coastline. On the Red Sea, such a disaster could harm several Middle Eastern and North African nations at once and create additional risks that could make the Red Sea all but impassable for however long the spill takes to clean up. With even high-priority traffic potentially unable to transit the area, the costs to global trade, thus far able to get on as usual despite the Houthi campaign, could quickly balloon to levels matching the worst fears of trade and financial analysts worldwide. And with such a potent ticking time bomb now sitting off the Yemeni coast, the whole world is in position to start asking a very uncomfortable question. How much do you trust the Houthis not to blow that thing up?
Now, we should emphasize there are some reasons to be optimistic. The Houthis did allow a temporary truce to allow the potential salvage operations, and their leaders seem to understand that a major oil spill right off their coast would be really bad news for their organization, along with everybody and everything else that wants to be in the Red Sea. But at the same time, that optimism should only extend too far. Remember, the Houthis were observed lighting the ship on fire after initial salvage operations came out to take a look at it, and the Houthis even went to the trouble of posting that footage online. And in the days since, the Houthis have continued to launch attacks against other vessels, including one with double the amount of oil as the Soyunion. Two ships, including that very, very full oil tanker, have reported being hit by ballistic missiles and kamikaze drones since the truce around the Soyunion was agreed. Although it's a deeply concerning prospect to consider, and rightfully so, the reality now is that there are no guarantees that the Houthis won't target this ship further. It is a sitting duck for them, easily in reach of drones and missiles, and although the Houthis typically fire in ones or twos, a combined assault of several projectiles or even explosive sea drones down at the waterline could rip a hole through the hull and bring all of that oil spilling out. The US and its coalition have been unable to deter the organization, and the motivations of its foremost backer, Iran, may see the Houthis urged to take decisive action while they have the opportunity. From the start, the Houthis' intent has been to hold global shipping hostage as collateral in order to force an end to the violence in Gaza. Now they have the means to do so, and while we certainly hope that they won't take advantage of that opportunity, we're not optimistic, and nor should anyone be. Thank you for watching.